Indianapolis. Here I am, beautiful Indianapolis airport. So about 12 miles <laughs> from the convention. There's gonna be a lot of Uber bills, I'm gonna guess. I'm testing out my fancy new Rode microphone. I'm hoping that this is actually gonna work for the, the festivities this weekend because I've never used this before. Well, that's not true. I used it once um, to test a Five Parsec from Home episode and I destroyed my other microphone's frequency because I had two of them together. So I didn't know that. I'm hoping that nothing like that happens here. This is largely an untested piece of technology. And I'm also not used to using just the iPhone. So this is gonna be, uh, it's gonna be touch and go. I've got the iPhone, I've got this microphone and a second microphone here, which will be for people I'm interviewing. And of course I've got a little tripod, which I'm gonna carry with me. It was kind of a nightmare getting here. All the flights were delayed and I almost got booted off my own plane because they screwed up. The seating arrangements, it was a nightmare, but anyway, it's all done. I'm here now, Indianapolis for Gen Con. It's Wednesday night. Nobody else is here. I'm totally alone. I'm <laughs> the Columbia Games guys got here, I guess, at like six in the morning. I assume they've been setting up all day. They're probably sacked out of sleep right now. But I am going to go down to the restaurant and have a goddamn drink because oh, it's been a day. Let me tell you, tomorrow I'm going to somehow make my way <laughs> to the convention. I gotta get my badge. Apparently some somebody has it here. I'm not sure who has it. And then at 11 o'clock, I'm doing the Free League panel. So that'll be cool to see them in action and have them talk about stuff. I got all, all kinds of stuff planned for this weekend. I'm gonna try and shoot as much, as, uh, much of it as I possibly can, but I have no idea what to expect. I've never done this before, never been here before. So it's gonna be interesting, I'm sure. We're in the convention hall. This is 15 minutes before they open up. This is the Columbia Games booth. You can see Harnwell stuff behind me. This is where I'm set up. I got all my, my little stuff here. I'm gonna be swamped with people any minute now. It's, it's huge, it's huge. Every conceivable designer is represented here. It's pretty well. I'm gonna take a little walk around and see what there is to see. Just getting a little little taste before the place opens. Only the exhibitors are here right now. It's gonna be nuts because we walk through the crowd and uh, I don't know how many tens of thousands of people are here, but it's it's crazy, man. It's crazy. So the hordes are all coming in now. I have a panel at 11 o'clock for Free League, but this is the first hour of the first day and something tells me I'm not gonna be able to get over there even though I got tickets. So you can't really see from my perspective, but there are thousands of people here. So here we are at Gen Con at the Columbia Games Horn World booth. Yes, this yes. This is Grant, of course, the head honcho here at Columbia Games. Hi. Uh, and the man who has brought me, your intrepid host, to Gen Con for the first time. So how's it going on this first day of the con? It's overwhelming. We're doing really well. We're having a great time. The people are coming in droves to say hello. And, uh, and our new books are just flying off the shelf. There they are. <laughs> yes, we have the hardback book, the uh, newest one, the 
Harn World that we kickstarted in the spring, and um, we airlifted in some copies here to have them in time for the show. And I'm so pleased to see all of these people taking an interest in this setting. Because it's warming, as isn't you it? guys know, Harn is like one of my favorite settings of all time, and to see all of these people come up. And there's a ton of like, you know, guys our age who are like, oh, I haven't seen Harn in 20 years. Yeah. But there's also like a bunch of young gamers who come up and they go, oh, what is this? And they start to get excited about it once we start to, you know, and, and I love the fact that, you know, they're getting excited about a really grounded setting. Yeah, you it's, know? it's really cool to see that. And it's, it warms the heart, right? Uh, because uh, we live we live in Harn, and, and, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, anyone's welcome. But, um, you know, I found that if, if you like it, then you really like it. So yes. uh, we take the time to uh, try to bring people into this world, and, and those that come, they yeah. tend to stick around a while. We bring the people in, and we get a chance to talk to them, and uh, a certain amount of them really fall in love. Three o'clock now, I've had a whole bunch of people come up to me, patrons, subscribers, tell me how much they love the channel, how much they appreciate it. Uh, it's been good. We're gonna go have dinner with the Columbia Games guys at seven o'clock. And then that's probably it for me until tomorrow. I have a meeting tomorrow morning at 8.30 with Professor Dungeon Master. Hey everybody, Trevor here. I'm at Gen Con and I have the unique privilege of sitting with Professor Dungeon Master of Dungeon Craft. How are you, sir? Thanks for joining me here today. Terrific, Trevor. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for... Uh, uh, great, great, great to be here with you. Yeah. So tell me uh, about the channel. Tell me how you got started, why you started the channel, all that kind of good stuff. I had started the channel. It was a fluke. So... Uh, my friend, Carrie, she said, you know a lot about this game. You should have a YouTube channel. I said, I don't know anything about YouTube. And she <laughs> says, it's easy. And I was like, but you need a camera. I don't have a camera. She goes, no, it's easy. You just use your cell phone. She doesn't know what she's talking about. <laughs> I mean, we're on a cell phone now. As we know now, yes. I called it Dungeon Craft because it was like, I did two videos a month started, when I started out. And one was a crafting video. And one was a, you know, uh, an advice on how to craft your game. And, you know, it just took off from there. Now, I don't, How long has it been now? It's like five years. Five years, okay. Like, wherever my interests take me, I just make videos on that. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of the same way. I Like, right now, I'm known for doing the big solo epic production campaign yeah. things, but people want to see more of that, obviously. But I have an interest in doing other stuff, like showcasing games that not a lot of people know about. And I know that's something that you're yeah. pretty big on, too. Because guess what? There's more to D&D &D yeah. than D&D. &D. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was funny because I started to watch more of your stuff and I really thought, you know, we're of a similar age and we're obviously of a similar generation in terms of DMing and gaming and, and sort of the philosophy on that. That's something I talk a lot about on my channel is the, is the philosophy of gaming in terms of like, what is the role of a DM? And you talk about this a lot, you know, about how your job isn't to set out a strict narrative and have the players walk through it. Right. Your job is to create obstacles and I completely resonated with that. Mm -hmm. um, now, you have a group, a regular group, right? In, yes. A regular in-person group, and how many players is that? Six. Six players, which, that's, uh, that's a fairly... I actually have three regular groups. Oh, of course yeah. you do. Of course. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and they're all about six players. And they're all in person? They are. You, they are. Um, so how, what's your, how long has the, the oldest group been together? 30 years. Really? Wow, that's great. There are members in the group that were playing 30 years ago. And have you been the, the I'll say GM, I yes. always say GM. You've been the GM the whole time. Yes. And has it been a continuous? Continuous campaign. See, that is the stuff of legends right there. That's fantastic, man. I, I should be so, I should be so lucky to get involved with something like this. But yeah. You started with D&D, &D, yeah. and then you kind of just evolved into your own version of D&D, &D, right? But you've always sort of kept around the whole D&D &D structure, mostly? I learned to play with D&D. &D. And then I was in a campaign. It was a Warhammer Fantasy role-playing right. campaign. And One then the, the guy who ran it was like, he was the greatest game master ever. He was so talented. And then he got married and didn't want to play anymore. So he gave me his game master notebook. And he's like, you can run the campaign now. <laughs> and I've continued it for 30 years. And in that time, we've evolved from, we went from playing Warhammer Fantasy role-play, which was, cool with the critical hit charts and stuff but it's a very crunchy game mm. 
and it was time consuming. And so I then gradually switched back to a D and D variant which is now Deathbringer, right. which is my game. And that is sort of loosely based on 5e structure, more or less? It's all d and I think all d and is just roll a 20 and roll high. Right. But the numbers align to 5e, because that's the most popular version of the game. Right. So when you make up a character, I made sure when you crunch out the numbers, it all comes out to the same right. 5e character. Right. I, as I said, I try and get my audience as far away from anything D&D as possible, just because, not because I have something inherently against D&D, even though I stopped playing it in the early 80s, um, because I found things like Warhammer and I immediately yeah. gravitated to that kind of stuff and Rollmaster and, and all the other millions of games that I played. But um, it's so hard to try and get people to see that there are games other than 5e out there. Uh, do you have, and I'm sure you've probably talked about this, but do you have any advice for game masters out there who want to try something else, but their group is hesitant because, well, we know D&D &D and that's what we want to play. Yeah. The best advice is run a one shot of something else. Run the game that you want to play and see if they don't like it. And it could be a minimalist version of D&D of &D, like Deathbringer or Knave. Right. It could be a retro but forward thinking game like Shadow Dark. Mm -hmm. It could be a game that has similar mechanics. You got a 20 sided die, but with new innovative mechanics like Into the Odd or one of its many variants. And whatever you want to run, just say, I'm going to do a one shot. And I'm going to. The key is not to really ask the players, <laughs> it's just to, just to say, look, I'm running Into the Odd next Saturday at 7 o'clock. Who's in? Right. And you do it on the text and you see who shows up. And usually, FOMO, if you're missing out, people will just, okay, I'll play it once. And then when they see how much more interesting these games are, you hook them. You gotta run the greatest session ever. No pressure. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, it's gotta be like, cause I remember the first Warhammer sessions I played, I, I was reticent to play that game. And then, two sessions and I was like, wow, this is so cool. So do you remember the moment where that happened? Like, oh, what yeah. was it? So Shadows over Bogenhofen. Of course. Of right, course. which is a, f I was terrified of that scenario. <laughs> well, when you meet the demon in the sewers, that was the me moment right. where it's like, I was a new character and I'm like, it's a demon, I gotta run away. Right. And, which is what that game did, it subverted expectations. And it was such a creepy scenario. Yeah that it was like, I have never experienced, I had never played Call of Cthulhu at the time. Warhammer is very in, influenced by Call of Cthulhu. Yeah, people yeah. often say that Warhammer is, you think yeah. you're playing D&D &D, and surprise, you're playing Call of Cthulhu. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a to totally different way of thinking about adventures. Because up until then, it was just like, well, we go through rooms and kill the monsters and level up. By the way, there's nothing wrong with that, mm -hmm. you know, so. Well, I think there's a lot wrong with that. Ah. That's, my, <laughs> that's my opinion. Uh, now, he, in terms of mechanics, I think that mechanics actually are really crucial to the feel of the game. Because if you look at Warhammer Fantasy, one of the big things, as you've already referenced, is these really brutal critical hits, right? right? You've got your set of wounds, which is basically a buffer between you and real damage, and then after that, you roll in these critical hit charges, yeah. and they can be horrifying. Yeah. If you were to, to be in the Empire in Warhammer, do you think you would have the same experience if someone was using D and D basic, as as instead of using the the house system of Warhammer Fantasy, do you think that would change I, the experience? Yeah, I think it can be done. So Black Sword Hack, mm. which is a variant of Black Hack by uh, Black Sword Hack, is by Kobayashi, and I saw an interview with him recently, and he said he wanted to run Power Behind the Throne mm. for his group, but they were just one guy just hated percentile dice, and so he created Black Sword Hack as a Warhammer hmm. D20, and uh, so it can be done. I think that the dice to me are just math rocks. So Warhammer, this is gonna get really into, <laughs> this is gonna okay. really, okay. <laughs> this is, I don't do this on my channel. I keep it more general, but like, all right, you start out with your, your new Warhammer character. You're gonna have a 35% weapon skill or a 40% weapon right. skill. You suck. That's like rolling 40% chance to hit is like you got to roll well, like 16 or better mm -hmm. to hit something or something, something like, that. like that yeah so yeah you got to roll high you got to roll 14 or 15 to hit anything and but it's the same math it works out to be the same math and 
Warhammer in the first edition, the dice explode. Right. Right on a on a D6, and you can replicate that in D and D by just you know having the twenty being a critical hit. Right. You get the same result with different math. It's like Call of Cthulhu. Like if you have fifty five percent weapon skill, it's like rolling a twelve or more on a twenty sided die. And for some players, it feels different. But for me, it's just like the mechanics are a means to the end. But there is certainly certain mechanics like well having fewer hit points. Mm -hmm. That definitely that changes the game for me. My players like 20 sided dice and they like rolling high. That's just, that's the mandate they've given me, you know? <laughs> so they wouldn't be too into like a black sword hack because you roll under the ability score, even though I, li I like that mechanic. But whether you roll high or low, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's a 20 sided die. A 20 sided die is just percentile dice, dice rounded to the nearest five. Right, and it's, it, that's absolutely true. My view has always been that, that yes, they are math rocks, but to me, people always say, well, what's the difference between 63 and 64? And I say, the difference between 63 and 64 is that if I've got a 63% chance to hit and I roll a 64, I hate that. I needed that 1%. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> so for me, it's about the mechanics really uh, uh, drilling down and telling the story of what happened. So I'm, I'm deeply simulationist. I'll admit that right off yep. the bat. And I understand that simulationist systems always become way too complex for most tables. But for example, a game like Harn Master, which I'm not sure if you're familiar with. I am. Harn Master is probably one of the most simulationist games out there. Uh, but with Harm Master, things like when you get hit, there's no hit points. If you get hit, it's a specific injury to a specific part of your body that does specific things. Yeah. So if I get hit in the left knee, there's a chance I'm going to go down. And if you go down in a combat, that's bad news. Mm. As anyone who's ever been in a fight knows, you don't want to be on the ground. No. Um, <clears throat> So to me, I like systems that help really tell the story. And, there, and I think that's a, a, a DMing uh, philosophical difference is a lot of DMs want to be able to just have the, roll the dice and then sort of freely improvise what that might mean or have the players do it, mm -hmm. right? Okay, you killed the orc, tell me how you did it. Yeah. But then there's systems that say, there's no need for that because the game will tell you exactly what happens. Right. And I think it's just a different, it's a different feel, it's a different type of game, a different atmosphere that it creates. Not that I'm against the old D20, it's just that I have grown to become, um, I think it's laziness actually, because I, I don't want to have to describe every little thing every time they, uh, yeah, yeah. there you go, I'm a bad DM. Uh. <laughs> 30 years, man, and, and 30 years in the same campaign. So let me ask you this, do we have a generational thing going on? Do you have like, or are they the same player characters they have? They're the same characters, much older. That's amazing. And now they have, some have children. Okay, like that's fam great. Families. That's great. So. Yeah. So the characters then, I mean, you're playing D&D, &D. Well, what level are these people after 30 years? They are 7th level. 7th <laughs> level! After 30 years, <laughs> you heard it here! <laughs> and they're fine with that. Yeah, I get a lot of comments on the channel, on my channel, like, who the hell wants to play with you? <laughs> and then, and uh, I've been on Roll for Combat a couple times, and um, Mark and Steven Glicker are like, um, like, how many magic items do they have? And I'm like, none. Yeah. <laughs> And they're like, what? what? What kind of crazy campaign is this? And uh, the and it is, there's a high level of lethality. Mm. Uh, we just, we lost a character over the last year, but there is, they're not dying all the time, mm. you know, because the characters continue. But it, they don't play, my players don't play to gain levels. They play for the story. Right. The emergent story that the, happens. Yes, it is an emergent story. It's not a story I think up. Right. They tell me ideas. Hey, I want to explore this idea. So just to be clear for these viewers, your philosophy is basically you have a setting, you have NPCs that all have motivations, and you throw the players into that world, and those players all have motivations, and if those motivations interact or right. conflict with other NPCs, that's the story. That's what happens. I'll have a triggering incident. The character's favorite tavern explodes. <laughs> As it does. So, you know, something something like that. There'll be uh, an initial incident that spurs them toward adventure, and then they pick the way they go. And I have a villain. I'll have a timeline for that villain. The villain wants something. I have a climax in mind in terms of where it would take place. And I let the players drive the action. Hmm. But I think if the scenario is well designed, it will drive itself. Right. Right. And you don't need to do that. So, for example, having a time limit. You need to get this thing 
The merchant hires you to ret retrieve this gem, but it has to be before sunrise. Mm -hmm. That drives the action. There are now now the players are okay. I can't take a short rest. I can't take a long rest. Right. I can't. I can't sleep it off these wounds. Like we have to go, and that drives the narrative. But the players drive it themselves. I think that's one of the most effective tactics as a GM is is something that was encapsulated rules wise in the Blades in the Dark game with the with the clock system. Are you yes. familiar with this? I mean, that's basically all that is is saying you've got X number of time units to do this thing. How you do it is up to you, and there's consequences the closer you get to that. Yeah, I uh, totally agree with that. Uh, well, listen, that's great, man. I know you've got a million other interviews set up, so thanks for joining me here today. Thanks for having me. So this is cool. I'm at Union Station at Indianapolis at the Gen Con, and this is a train, actual train, that I think is converted into rooms. So that is pretty, pretty cool. Hey, buddy. How you guys doing? Day two, exhausted again. Met a lot of patrons today here at the booth, the old Columbia Games booth, which has been fantastic. A lot of subscribers, a lot of people actually recognize me. They come up, they go, hey, I like your shoes. That's kind of cool. That's something. It's a long day here. I'm kind of over it. <laughs> I'm over the crowds. But uh, another two days to go. And it's, it's just been cool kind of walking the floor to seeing who's here. Like all of the major game developers are here. I talked to Modiphius. They actually gave me uh, the new Star Trek solo Captain Vlog book. They're sort of hinting that they want me to do something with it, which is great. I had a little chat with uh, Dwarven Forge, which was kind of cool. They do like uh, miniature terrain. It'd be great to get something going with them. You know, a little, uh, a little back and forth there with that. Uh, who else? Uh, Savage Worlds is here. Uh, obviously, Free League is here. I'm doing an interview with Tomas, the head of Poncho, uh, tomorrow. Apparently going out for dinner, I think, tonight with some of the YouTubers, which is kind of cool. So, getting to know them, getting to know the community. Hello, people. It is I, Trevor Dado, and I have a very special guest. Introduce yourself. Hey, I'm Kelsey Dion from the Arcane Library. Yes, this is this is a rock star in the, in the industry. Um, uh, tell us all about why you're a rock star, Kelsey. Oh, allegedly. I, I, <laughs> allegedly. I'm a rock star, but I, I, uh, I am a writer, really. And I uh, created a game called Shadow Dark RPG, uh, which just had a Kickstarter earlier this year, and it, it did pretty well. So. And what is pretty well? It did about 1.3 million on Kickstarter. So. Okay, so you know you're doing all right, I suppose. I get to be a little bit of a rock star for now. <laughs> yeah. So we are sitting here at Gen Con, and I have the uh, uh, pleasure and opportunity to, to talk to Kelsey here about all kinds of stuff. It's going to be super cash. Uh, I'm just kind of interested, like, what sets apart your game from everybody else's game? Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of games like mine. So it's a fantasy RPG that's sort of in the vein of really old Dungeons and Dragons. But what I tried to do that I think sets it apart is to take the gameplay style of original versions of D&D that are almost 50 years old at this point and don't remind me. <laughs> I know, I know. And I, I really tried to modernize them with game design that's become more common over the last, you know, 20 years. Since. Like what, for example? Well, like I think one really important thing is that everything is a roll high target. So that wasn't okay. actually true in, in the older editions where there was a big mixture of rolling high and low. And it seems like a small thing, but when you don't know if you're aiming high or low, it can actually be a lot of confusion for people. So I kind of tried to port some of that always rolling high is good mentality over and structure the whole system around that and make old school style play more approachable for people who maybe haven't done it before. That's cool. I'm just gonna, I'm just adjusting. Oh, yes. <laughs> we don't do any edits on this. We just go full out. Yes. There we go. All right. Um, so uh, when did you start the design process? It was probably about four years ago. It, it it started as a few ideas and maybe a little bit of tinkering with currently existing fantasy RPGs. And then I'm picky, so I started to be like, well, I want it to be a little bit different and a little bit changed. And those became greater and greater. And um, I started to think maybe I can turn this into a game. And 
I commissioned one piece of art that I was like, well, this would be really cool if I could write a game using this one piece of art. And that kind of just started the domino effect. Oh, that's cool. It, it really inspired me to turn it into something for real. Because when you have a cool piece of art, you got to do something with yeah, it. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So how did you get into gaming in the first place? I, I've been gaming my mostly my whole life. I um, grew up in southern Wisconsin, kind of around the old TSR crowd. And it was really a, actually a very strong part of the culture where I grew up. Gaming was very healthy there. I was a bastion of it. And so I got introduced to the game really early by some friends and started playing at the local game store and then started going every Saturday and going to cons. I went to Gen Con and this is my first time back at Gen Con since I was a child, really. So, really? Wow. Yeah. yeah so. how, how has it changed? It it's, wow, well, it's gotten a lot <laughs> crazy. Well, you know, it really, it's always been the biggest one, I think. Yeah. yeah. And it still feels that way. I, I think that there's definitely a lot more people, and I think the tone has shifted more towards board games. Right, but, right, right, right. Yeah, it's, it's. I mean, another thing that's changed is now I can drink beer here, so, yeah. That's why I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, of what what happens now? You've got you've done the Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. The game is delivered, right? It's it's going to be delivering in our hope is October. Oh, October. So okay. Very soon, but okay. So then, so that, then you have like a big release, a big launch. I don't know how this works. Right. I'm sure we will, because it's gonna. They're all gonna get to the warehouse and then start shipping out. And I think we're gonna. I'm gonna personally be very excited. I think there will be some fanfare because I hope it's like a little bit of an early holidays for everyone. They're getting the stuff they finally had been hoping to receive yeah. for a bit. So. And how many people is that? Like, like you say, one point, you know, whatever millions in Kickstarter pledges and such. But how many yeah. people does that translate to? Man, when we include the people that pledged late after the Kickstarter, we're talking about around fourteen to 15,000 people. Wow. Right? I know. I know. Wow. It's like... That's a whole lot of people that want to play the game. Fill up a whole cafeteria with that many people. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One or two cafeterias, yeah. maybe. <laughs> So do you have any plans after release about what the next step is? Yeah. I, that you can talk about, I presume? Oh, of course, yeah. And there are no real secrets. I uh, I originally wrote this game because I love writing adventures. I, I'm, I'm much more of an adventure writer. That's actually what I was known for in the years prior to designing this game. Yeah, and you wrote for, like, Watsi, didn't you? I Maybe. Yeah, maybe? <laughs> if I have, I don't know if I... Well, it's... Do I have to cut that out? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'll just say that maybe I have, maybe I have. I haven't, yeah, okay. But, um, all right. All right. But I've, I've definitely worked with people in the industry and um, lots of friends who are both indie writers and people who have worked for professional publishing houses. I've been lucky enough to have a variety of friends that wanted a little bit of my input. So, right. Right. Yeah. So, so, so now it launches and 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 what happens next? What's the general thing with with yeah, the project? I think lots of adventures. That's what I really am excited to write. That's my favorite thing to create. Um, I'm really excited to see third-party people making material for the game because that's that was really important to me. I, I released the game kind of on the tail of the OGL crisis, and it's heavy on people's mind. Can I write material for your game? And I really hope people want to. And, um, yeah. So, so how exactly does the OGL thing affect the game as it is now? Like, well, what's been the repercussions of that for you? Yeah, it was well. It was really thorny during about the week where nobody knew it was going on, and I actually had to rewrite a ton of the book in case we couldn't keep a great deal of what was in there, because right. a lot of it is inspired by original D&D, &D and it's trying to kind of call back to that nostalgia and use some of those familiar things from it. Um, however, Wizards of the Coast released the Creative Commons license that let me keep a lot of the original material, and so not a lot had to change, really, okay, well, that's thankfully. Good. Yeah, yeah, a that's few good. things, but nothing significant. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, what? Uh, where can people find this this book of yours, this game of yours, if not on Kickstarter? Like, what? How does that all work? Yeah, it's like transitioning from Kickstarter to my website. We're like doing that movement. So you can still find it on Kickstarter, um, Shadow Dark RPG. If you search it up, it'll still come up, and it is still open for late pledges as of right now because. We, we ordered some overstock to try to account for that. Smart. <laughs> Planned it out a little bit. <laughs> um, and then we also, on my website, thearcanelibrary.com, I have all of the digital material available there if that's just what you're interested in instead. Okay, cool, yeah. cool. Well, that's great. Is there anything you want to say to the fans? Um, <laughs> I am the biggest fan ever of Trevor, and you can fight me for it. <laughs> well, <laughs> thank you. Comments. <laughs>
Like and subscribe. Like and subscribe. Yes, do it. Hit the bell. Hit the bell. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Day three, the Gen Con vlog. I'm exhausted. I was out way too late last night with all those other YouTubers. Terrible. Terrible. Oh. Are you in the middle Uh, no, it's okay. I had to interrupt that because it was a fan. A fan who's stopping. Tell me, much you like the channel, how inspired he was, which is great. That is quite nice to hear. Anyway, it's day three now. As I said, I'm exhausted. Way too much Irish whiskey. Last night with all of the people, Royce. Um, did a panel today, which was okay. Went pretty good, sorry. Uh, it's busy, 88,000 people here, and boy, you can tell. I'm on my way right now to the Free League booth to do an interview with Tomas, who's the head honcho over there. He's also offered to play a bunch of games tonight. I don't think I'm gonna do it. I am too beat, I am too tired. I'm, uh, I'm here for the, the schmoozing and the networking. Hey everybody, it's Trevor here. This is uh, Gen Con. I am with Tomas, who is the head honcho over at Free League, and it is my pleasure to be uh, talking to you and asking a few things. I'm sure you've answered all of these questions a million times already. Ah, uh, you never know. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, so first thing first, out of the way, how did the whole Free League phenomenon start? Oh yeah, it started. It's like over ten years ago now. We started out just you know, freelancing, doing fun stuff for other publishers. Like there was a, we're a Swedish uh, company and we worked for, uh, did freelance stuff for another publisher that was existed back then. Mm -hmm. Then they went out of business and asked us if we want to take over like one of the game projects they were working on. So after some hesitation, we decided to do it. And then we decided to do that, we needed a company. So that's how Free League started. And, and then, what was the first game? The first game has actually never been done in English. It's called Suave Winter or uh, Winter of Sulfur. I've uh, heard people talk about right. that. Right, uh, there's actually a translated quick start somewhere online of, uh, of that. Well, then it's a pretty nice game, but that was in, and it came out in 2012. Yeah. But what, and then we worked on some other stuff and one of the, there's a game, a Swedish RPG called Mutant. There was a long line of mutant games. The first one came out in the 80s. That was my first game, my first RPG. It's a post-apocalyptic game. So we started pitching for a new edition of this game in Swedish called Mutant and then became Mutant Year Zero. And fairly soon after we figured, let's try translating this and see if we can, you know, publish it you know, right. overseas and see what happens. That's how I found out about you guys with Mutant. Yeah. Um, the, the house system you used, the, the dice bowl system, was that the old Mutant system or is this your own thing? It, it's our own thing actually, but we it was created for Mutant Year Zero. Right. Uh, so that's why it, it became the Year Zero system. It, it was never intended to be like an overarching system for many games. It was just the rule set for Mutant Year Zero that we developed for that mm -hmm. game. So then we wanted to do other games. We did Coriolis uh, shortly after, Tales from the Loop, and, and basically by chance we decided to use a version of the Mutant Year Zero rules. And that kind of just evolved into the Year Zero right. engine, as so we call it now. I find it, I find it so fascinating that you guys have the same, ba I mean, in most cases, obviously Dragon Bane is a different uh, animal, but that you you are able to implement the same core rule set and just yeah, tweak it a little bit yeah, every now yeah. and then to give it the flavor. Like with Aliens, I just played in the starter set a friend of mine ran, yeah. and of course the stress mechanic is perfect. Yeah. <laughs> so it's so great It's so great to see a system that's so easily tweakable to really do what you need to do based on the game. Yeah, that's really what we want to do. It's like to keep the same basic core to, to make it you know fairly easy to learn. And also if you have played one, at least you can learn another one fairly easy, but still, have it to be adaptable enough to adapt it to other settings, other themes, other types of stories, so we can make that tweak in each game to make it fit uh, that particular theme, style of play, and the stories we want to tell. So yeah, that is that was what we tried to do the whole the whole way through. Right. Well, it seems to be working. You know, <laughs> it's great stuff. Uh, so how do you, and maybe you can't talk too much about this, but how did you wind up getting all of these huge licenses? Yeah, I mean, it was a bit step-by-step -step process. I mean, we did licensing, uh, we didn't even view it really as licensing. Like I mentioned, Mutant was actually a license. It's still a license because that was a, a game that was, had been done since the 80s. 
So we're still doing that as a license. That was one of the first games that we ever did. So it was just natural to us to, to look at other. We, the first game, the one I mentioned, the Winter Sulfur, Winter of Sulfur, it's actually based on a book series of fantasy novels. So that was also a collaboration uh, with an ex a partner. We didn't design that world ourselves. We based it on a series of, of books. So. And then we did Tales of the Loop, which was a collaboration with Simon Stollenhall, who's a great artist and storyteller. So that was also a collaboration. And then that got some success and attention, it, uh, not least over here at the Ennies, like six years ago. And that led us to talking to people who had connections in, in, uh, in Hollywood, and that made us pitch for at that time, Alien and Blade Runner at the same time. Alien ended up being the first one and then Blade Runner. Right. But that's kind of was a step-by-step -step thing. Right, well, I mean, it's a massive thing when you see these, and then you guys got The Walking Dead as well. It's yeah. just all yeah. of these huge franchises. Yeah, yeah. That's fantastic. It must feel great to have the trust of all of these producers. It does, it does. It's yeah. fantastic. And we've been working with uh, those three licenses. We work with the same uh, guy. Uh, his name is Yoli Favi. He works out of LA. He's got a company called Gen 1 Entertainment, and he kind of works in this space. So he's been very extremely helpful in making that happen as well. So what would you say, like, philosophically is the thing that separates Free League from other companies? Do you think there's something you can put your finger on? Uh, I mean, I can't speak to others really, but I can speak to what we try to do and what we, what we uh, and I think what we always strive to do is, is to, it has to have, uh, every game needs like the rules supporting the theme and the, and the types of stories we want to tell. So like, effective rules that aren't too fiddly and that are fairly focused on, on creating the kind of stories and the mood and the theme that you want to play. That combined with, well, what we feel is the po highest possible quality of art and graphic design. So it has to have both things. And I think that's what we really always try to do. It has to have the, that art and packaging and, and design, graphic design to immerse players in the world but there also has to be a game system that, that really catches that and they work together in the same, you know, to create that experience. And that's, that's I think that's our philosophy and, and uh, what we always, always try to do. Well, it's working out incredibly well. The reason why I wound up doing the Blade Runner series on my channel, which you haven't seen it yet, go see it, it's the best thing I've ever done, yeah. uh, is because when, when you guys sent me the Blade Runner starter set, I didn't have a huge interest in Blade Runner as, a, as an RPG setting at the time, but then I opened that starter set and I saw these incredible, like, props, props that could be yeah. out of the movie. And I thought, this is amazing. And then, of course, I read the rules, and I thought, oh, no, that's, that's perfectly fitting to this yeah. thing. So thanks for your help in, in making that. Oh, thank you. To, it was to, great. To you should watch it. Yes, yeah. yes. See, you heard it from the man himself. <laughs> I keep looking at the wrong place. I don't, I don't normally use an iPhone as a camera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> What's next on the agenda that you can talk about? I know there's probably a bunch of things you can't talk about. Well, there's a bunch of stuff. I mean, for Blade Runner, we are working on a new case file called Ele F F Fiery Angels. So we're also lots of handouts doing that whole thing, continuing that story. So that, that I'm working on that right now, <laughs> putting the finishing touches on the text, and we're moving on to play testing. So that's really. Uh, Cool, we have a bunch of stuff for Dragomain coming up that I can't really talk about yet, but there's definitely stuff coming. And of course, we have a Kickstarter in August 29th for the Moria expansion for the One Ring. So that's That's fantastic. That's I'm happening. so glad, I was so glad that you guys got that license because that is, that's one of my favorite, it's obviously, it's the greatest fantasy setting of all. And that game system is so great. And when I knew it was in your hands, I was like, this is, you can't go wrong. So it's <laughs> the marriage of two fantastic things. So Yeah, it's great working with Francesco. I mean, he's just a fantastic guy and a great designer so have, working with him on the one ring has just been a you know a true blessing for for us well that's awesome thank you so much for your time and thank good you. luck to everything in the future thank you day four back at the booth uh, done I'm done <laughs> I'm done. Too many crowds. Too much. It's time to go home. But uh, in the meantime, it's been great. And uh, had some great, great dinners again with some of the more of the YouTube folks. Fantastic. Anyway, it's, uh, yeah, it's been, so, it's been something. It's been an experience, but it's time to go home. Yeah. So that's it, the end of the con. I'm now at the Indianapolis airport, going to my gate. I'm super early, um, but I thought I'd check in here at the very end of the whole process. 
I'm exhausted, of course. Um, huge, gigantic thank you to Columbia Games for bringing me out on this little trip. It was really fantastic. <clears throat> you know, all the things that I shot and I'm editing right now, and I'll put up soon, were great. But what was really great is all the stuff that didn't get shot, all of the wonderful moments I had with people, especially the other YouTubers, like Kelsey and Dan from Dungeon Craft and, and that whole gang. We spent a lot of time together and, and you know, when, uh, when I met them, it felt as though I had known them for years. It was wild, it was, uh, it was, uh, yeah, it was fantastic. So, um, great experience and I gotta do some interviews with them and we're gonna try and swap some stuff and get some stuff going to really make the channels work better together, which is, uh, very exciting actually. I feel like I've ascended to some elite level, <laughs> which is kind of silly, but yeah, it's been great. It's been a great experience, um, but now I need to return to my home in Texas and have myself a little rest, which I tend to do, and then I'll start editing this little stuff and we'll see what it looks like at the end. Thanks for joining me on this little mad rush and uh, see you all on the next episode of Me, Myself and Die.